Everyone, welcome to the Mattress Recycling Council webinar on life cycle analysis. We'll wait just a few minutes to give people a chance to log in and then we'll get started. Are we seeing people start to log in, Tom? We have 41 people, 42 people present already and the number is growing. Okay, so I'll just um, get started with a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, welcome everyone. We're glad that you could join us today. My name is Mike Gallagher. I manage the Mattress Recycling Council's Research and Innovation Program. Joining me today are the Chief Operating Officer of Mattress Recycling Council, Mike O'Donnell, and also from Scope 3 Consulting, Kyle Meisterling and Brandon Krasinski. Uh, we're pleased you could join us. Uh, a couple other housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our website at a later date. We'll send you a link to that information when it's available after the conference. Also on the website is a copy of the full life cycle analysis report and an executive summary. We'll have a uh, question and answer room open for you to pose questions to any of the panelists today. And if um, uh, we will address all of these things as time permit and any other questions on the website at a later date as well. So wait just a couple more minutes or another minute or two and then we'll get started. Okay, why don't we get started. Um, uh, so again, my name is Mike Gallagher, heading the research program at MRC. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Um, for those who aren't familiar with MRC, this is just a little bit of information about us. The um, uh, estimates currently of mattresses discarded by consumers each year is somewhere between 15 and 20 million. MRC operates in states which have mattress recycling laws. And we've been in operation since 2015. And we have contracts with 15 recycling facilities. We achieve a recycling rate of about 75 plus percent. So this is a, an interesting public private sector partnership that is making a difference. MRC is a nonprofit organization which administers mattress recycling in currently three states, California, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, soon to join in um, uh, 2024, Oregon has adopted some mattress recycling laws, so they will be working with MRC to do recycling programs there next year. Next slide, please. Since launching the program, we've recycled more than 11 million mattresses, 12.3 million cubic yards of landfill space has been saved. Uh, 380 million pounds of material has been diverted from landfills. To give you an idea of what that sort of size is, if you imagined 12 million cubic yards, imagine sort of a one acre lot with mattresses about a mile and a half high. That's how much volume a uh, 12.3 million cubic yards is. So it's a substantial volume of material. Next slide. So why did we undertake a life cycle analysis? Well, first, when we started our program research program in 2018, our initial objectives were to improve operational efficiency of recycling operations, improving output quality and throughput in order to reduce the cost of recycling. And then another key objective was to diversify and grow end use applications for the materials recovered. Uh, however, as we began to dig into the details, we also felt that it was very equally important to understand our environmental impacts and to use this information to inform stakeholders, to support policy development, to guide future decisions of MRC and to encourage collaboration on how we can make our, uh, our performance better, but also our environmental impacts better. Next slide, please. So, what it, for those not familiar with the life cycle analysis, this is a very data-driven, intensive data-driven process. 
Uh, for this study, we looked at over 1.6 million mattresses for calendar year 2021 in California. Uh, these mattresses were collected at over 200 collection sites, around 15,000, 14, 15,000 shipments to 10 recycling facilities and then shipped to end use markets. So there's a lot of data behind this study. It is a very rigorous methodology under ISO guidelines which have us or allow us to calculate various environmental impacts. With that, I will turn it over to uh, our um, scope three consultants who will give an introduction to their organization and run through the data that we developed. Thanks, Mike. Okay. I'm Kyle Meisterling. I'm with Scope 3 Consulting. Uh, at Scope 3, we specialize in life cycle assessments. We have a lot of experience from national and state scale recycling systems to innovative biorefinery, uh, chemical production routes, and, and, and many other studies as well. Uh, we, what we do is we build system models that from the ground up are designed to be scaled and updated. This is particularly useful in the realm of end of life management and recycling where tracking annual performance can be important. At scope three, our mission is to make it easier to inspect, understand and compare life cycle assessment models. And all of this is in service of producing environmental assessments that can be put to work and used to make decisions and confidently inform stakeholders. Now, if we cut to the chase here and, and first look at some big picture results, um, if we look at impacts like climate, greenhouse gases, water use, and energy, uh, we saw robust, uh, robust uh, reductions in these impacts. So if we, if we consider climate impact, um, the benefit of recycling amounts to something like 100 million miles of, uh, of vehicle travel. Uh, the benefits in, in water use uh, sum up to about the, the equivalent water use of about 37,000 people in a year. And likewise, for energy, you know, the, the reduced energy use uh, amounts to something like the electricity use for 40,000 uh, 40, people. So again, we found uh, these robust benefits to the recycling system. And now I will talk through some of the details of the modeling and get into a little bit more of the results. Here we're looking at the boundaries of our system. So for any life cycle assessment, we have to decide what is going to be included in the study and what would be uh, outside the boundaries of our study. So in this picture, we have this kind of this green dotted um, box, which denotes our system boundary. So basically everything inside that dotted box we modeled. And if we start on the left side here, um, where we have the use of the mattresses, we consider two kind of types of use. One would be in a commercial setting, something like a hospital uh, or, a, uh, or a hotel. And then, of course, we have consumer use, which is, you know, mattresses and, and sleep products used at home. So for commercial, for the commercial setting, the, the mattresses enter the system boundary basically when they leave the facility and they enter it and, they, and they're loaded onto a truck. And uh, that truck then brings these mattresses to a recycler. So that, that shipping from a commercial site to the recycler is included. If we then look at the consumer use side, there's a few different ways that mattresses can get to recyclers uh, from consumers. And one, one major is a permanent collection sites. And so once the mattress shows up at a permanent collection site, then again, we track the freight from that site to the recycler, similar with collection events and cleanup events. Now, the one case where no freight is included in our model for consumer mattresses is if a mattress is delivered directly by a consumer or an independent collector to a recycler. 
Um, and so again, for that consumer travel, if, you know, if, if someone drives to take their mattress to a permanent collection site, we didn't include that in the system boundary, although we did uh, include kind of sensitivity cases uh, for, for those impacts. So then moving again to the right, we have this large blue uh, rectangle in the middle, which represents the primary recyclers in California. There's about 10 facilities that deconstruct mattresses. And we surveyed these facilities and we collected primary data to model their operations. And then when material leaves the facility, it can, the, some material is reused. So reuse would uh, includes whole mattress units to be reused as mattresses. It could include um, foam to be directly repurposed in some other applications or something like a spring to be reused. Some material goes to further processing before it is sold, you know, sold into a, uh, its final use market. So an example of further processing would be where foam is shredded and bonded to produce rebond carpet pad. And then a small amount of material is combusted for energy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that waste to energy uh, in a couple of slides. So then at the far right of this picture, we have uh, three boxes representing displaced materials and products. And this is a critical part of the study because when recycled material is made available to the marketplace, it can displace um, production of new or virgin materials. So this could be in the case of a product, like if a whole mattress is reused, then that would be uh, potentially displacing a whole mattress. Similarly with um, rebond foam pad, where it's displacing virgin polyurethane foam, and uh, and same at, same with energy. If it's being combusted and the energy is being recovered, then it could displace some other energy source. So if we look at the flow of material through the system, again, on the left-hand side of this uh, chart, we have the different kind of collection sites, the routes that the material can get into the recycling system. Then it goes through the recyclers, and we have these different materials that are recovered. So about 69% of the material goes toward recycling with steel, foam, quilt, and wood being the, the largest materials in that stream. Then we have about 8% that goes to energy recovery and, um, and reuse. And so on the waste to energy, WTE there represents waste to energy. Most of that waste to energy is actually wood. And uh, the amount of other material that is being combusted is very small. In, in 2001, I think it was like 0.1%. And in 2002, I think it's essentially zero. So most of that, or you can think about all of that WTE there is uh, wood combustion. And like I said, a, a about an equal amount of reuse in material. Uh, of different components of the mattress or the whole, actually whole mattress, I think is the largest uh, single reuse stream by mass. And then finally at the bottom there, we have uh, uh, about 23% of the process material is going to landfill. So we have about 41,000 tons of material being recycled. And again, this is for year 2021 in California. In our study, we included 11 different types of environmental impacts, and we kind of apportioned those into headline impacts and supporting impacts, and the headline impacts being climate change, water use, total energy demand, uh, smog formation, and particulate matter emissions. And we will focus on the headline emissions today, just so that you all don't get kind of overwhelmed with information, but if you're interested in the performance of the other uh, of the other indicators, again, uh, please check out the full study on, on the MRC website and we'll share a link to that um, later in the later in the presentation and also in a follow-up email that we will include the, the link to the study. Now in, in this LCA, there's 
there's, as I hinted at when we were looking at that system diagram, there are incurred impacts and displaced impacts. So incurred impacts are the emissions that we can measure from systems within uh, this, from processes within this recycling system. So examples of these incurred impacts would be mattress collection and transport. So um, I think Mike, as, as Mike mentioned, there's something like 14,000 truck shipments in during the year 2021. Um, from over 200 different collection sites, and all those are bringing material to recyclers. So all of those truck trips are included. Um, there's also transfers between some facilities, between some of the 10 recycling facilities. There's the energy use at the primary recycling facility. So we include the energy, the equipment, and the supplies used at those uh, at those at those facilities. We also have kind of post-processing um, activities, which would include rebond uh, rebond foam pad manufacturing. And then we have the transport from either the recycling facility or the post-processing facilities to their um, end markets. So those are all examples of incurred emissions from our recycling system. Now, on the other side of the ledger, we have potential displacement benefits. And again, these are, this is production of virgin materials that could be avoided with the supply of these recycled recovered materials. So examples of displacement benefits that we model in the system would be avoided production of virgin materials. So for example, steel, polyurethane foam, um, and fabric and fiber. So this is from the material recovery. And uh, in the case when components are reused, then we have avoided production of these products, which, is, which would include mattresses, steel springs, and again, polyurethane foam. And then also we have avoided transport uh, from, from these manufacturing facilities, again, to the final market. Now, an important factor in our study, and which we included to kind of be on the conservative side, is for the baseline scenario, we assume that one kilogram of a mattress-derived material displaces less than one kilogram of the competing virgin material. So, and depending on the type of product or material being recovered, it can range from, for the baseline scenario, 50% to 90%. So in the case of foam, uh, foam rebond pad, we assume that there's a 50% displacement rate, which means that if you produce 100 pounds of rebond foam pad from recovered material, then that 100 pounds would displace only 50 pounds of virgin polyurethane foam. For, the re, for items which are reused, we assume a 75% displacement rate. And for other commodities, we assume a 90% displacement rate. So now if we look at a little bit more detailed results, this chart is showing results for the baseline scenario. This is... Um, this matches the, uh, the, the system in California for 2021 that we modeled, and, and this is showing climate impact in kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And here we're showing per ton of, um, of mixed mattress unit inputs. So if we start at the left, the first group of impacts here we show are collection and transfers. And that's that first purple bar on the left. And purple is representing uh, what we're calling the primary recycling system, which includes collection, deconstruction, and landfilling. But on the first bar there, we have collection and transfers. So that's basically the freight network to get mattresses from the point of collection or the, from the point of generation to the recycling facilities. Then the next set of bars there is processing and manufacturing. So this is two parts here. The purple part is the primary uh, recycling system. So that's the, primarily the deconstruction of the mattresses, which also includes some shredding of pocket coils. 
And then we have the blue bar, which is remanufacturing. And most of that is the rebond foam process to convert recovered foam into rebond foam pad. And then we have the third bar there is emissions due to landfilling, that 23% of uh, input material that, that ends up in the landfill. Those are impacts from landfill. And then the final incurred impact shown here is transport to market. So once the material is recovered, either, for example, could be getting steel to a, a, a steel smelting facility or um, transporting the rebond foam to a, to a distributor. So then we come to the displaced products. And again, this is the avoided production of virgin materials. And so you can see there foam and steel are the two major parts of those displaced um, impacts. And again, for steel, the displacement rate implicit here is about 90%. And for foam, that's mostly due to the rebond, um, the rebond foam, pa foam pad. So those are being, uh, the displacement rate for that is 50%. And then there's a little bar again for displaced transport. Finally, we end up on the right there, that orange bar, which shows the total net impact of our recycling system. So again, I just want to drive this point home about net impacts. Again, we have these incurred impacts, and then we have, which are, which are positive in the sense that these are emissions. Um, and then we have possibly displaced impacts, which are avoided, and so they're negative. And then we have this net total. And so in this figure, we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but it, you know, it's just a schematic to to make sure we understand how we how we're showing these results. So the diamond shows the net impact for the kind of baseline uh, scenario, and then the whiskers there show the range of impacts for the displacement rates that we assume. So if the bar goes far down, then that's assuming the highest displacement rate. In most cases, that would be assuming a one-to-one -one displacement rate. And where the whisker goes up towards zero, um, that means that that indicates a, um, I guess you could say the least optimistic displacement rate, a lower displacement rate. So if we look at um, our five main indicators here going from left to right greenhouse gases water impact energy impact smog and particulates all five of these impacts show pretty robust benefits from the recycling system and and for all of them even with the uh, lowest displacement rate assumption uh, we see benefits to the recycling system and we can we can we can we see that by all of the none of the whiskers uh, pass above the zero mark. In which, if the whisker does pass above the zero mark, that would that would indicate that the um, the 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 recycling system wouldn't be uh, providing environmental benefit in that case. But here we see that for all of these displacement rates the recycling system is producing robust benefits in all of these impacts. And again, we call this, these, we are, we made these displacement rate assumptions to be on the, on the conservative side. So we, in the, in the course of doing the study, we modeled a lot of different scenarios. And so you can think about these as kind of building blocks with which we can kind of answer different questions and construct different scenarios. So the first, at the first case, we modeled five different sleep product types. And so basically this is like five different types of mattresses and foundations. So we have pocket spring mattresses, wire tied spring mattresses, all foam mattresses, then two types of foundations, one that would be all wood construction and one would, which would include metal and wood. And from these five types of sleep product types, we, uh, we make a mix of that represents 
the mix that we found in California. And so as part of a different study, which for the data for which you can also find on the MRC website, um, there was a count done at, at a couple different uh, recycling facilities to basically get a sense of what the type, what the mix was that the recyclers were seeing. And so we constructed a, a mix to represent California out of those five different sleep types. The next set of bullets here are processing models. So this is the question is how the, these, these models, how do you process a whole mattress? And the first sub bullet here, hand deconstruction, this is the current dominant process in California. So when we get a mattress, it's uh, sliced open and the materials are basically removed by hand to, to recover those different materials. So, um, so in addition to the hand deconstruction, when the, the pocket coils are shredded to separate the steel from the, from the fabric cover on those pocket coils. So that's the hand deconstruction uh, method. In addition, uh, we modeled incineration and pyrolysis of the whole unit with steel recovery. So the, again, these are not systems that are currently operating in California, but they do occur elsewhere. And so we wanted to be able to answer the question, what are the environmental impacts look like with, with those type of processing models? And in addition, we also modeled uh, some different freight systems where we compact, uh, we use a compaction truck to, to make the freight more efficient. So in, in essence, we can get twice the number of units per truck. And then finally, once we have different materials recovered from the mattresses, so uh, if you know if we recover some foam from a mattress, what can we do with it? Um, there's rebond foam pad manufacturing. Uh, there's reuse, which are the two uh, the two main processes occurring in California right now. But we also included uh, chemical recycling to recover polyols. We included combustion of the foam, pyrolysis, and of course landfill. So again, uh, the polyol recovery via chemical recycling and pyrolysis, these are not, the, and, and for the most part, combustion, these are not things that are occurring currently in California. And similarly for wood, we have a couple different um, end uses there, um, as well as for other materials. So again, the point of all this is that uh, we can model different systems at different times and we can look forward to see you know maybe the mix of sleep product types is changing so you know what will what will the what could the system look like in the future and if we if we compare a couple different processing scenarios here um, we see that so in in this chart let me take a step back here what this chart is basically showing is relative impacts um, compared to if you were to landfill the material. And so on the far left, you we have mechanical deconstruction and recycling, which is basically the system in California. And then the next set of bars is chemical recycling. And so this would be, again, deconstruction with chemical recycling of the recovered foam. So basically, instead of the foam going to reuse or foam or rebond foam pad manufacturing, it would go to chemical recycling for polyol recovery. And we see that the mechanical deconstruction and the chemical recycling scenarios, they look pretty similar. And then we get into incineration, which has a worse greenhouse gas um, impact compared to landfilling. And then finally pyrolysis, which is uh, somewhere in the middle. So again, I just wanna stress that the bar is on the left, the mechanical deconstruction. That's what's occurring in California now. And the chemical recycling, incineration, and pyrolysis set of bars. These are hypothetical scenarios that we are um, that that we can compare to landfilling to see how these all these other systems would compare to uh, landfilling mattresses. And again, with this kind of modular setup of the of the model, we can make comparisons between different data subsets. 
So again, we can we can look at impacts by different mattress type. We can assess alternative transportation methodologies. We can look into the future and perhaps see what kind what the different product mixes will be. And we can ask what if questions about, well, what if we institute this type of infrastructure or processing scenarios? And what would what would the likely environmental impacts of, of those different kind of management practices be? So that was a, a overview of the methodology. As you can, as you probably know, there's a lot of details in here, and you can dig into those details um, at the full LCA report on the MRC website. And I believe with that, I will hand it back over to Mike Gallagher for some closing thoughts. Actually, Kyle, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out, but Mike oh, Gallagher. Mike O'Donnell, I'm sorry. Yes, right. Mike Gallagher, if you could put your camera back on, that would help as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating today. We had fantastic turnout for this webinar. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this will be recorded and posted on our website, so folks that were unavailable can certainly take a look at it. Um, MRC has demonstrated seven years of continuous improvement over our programs. Um, we're an example of a recycling program that works. We've had great collaboration and cooperation um, with our, our government uh, partners and our industry partners. And this LCA is a logical extension of all of those years of work. This took us about two years to put together. And even as we started it, we discovered that we had a lot of missing data points. So we created studies which gave us more data about what is in a mattress, uh, what is the composition of mattresses, what type of mattress sizes are out there being sold and then discarded. And all of those studies are being posted and have been posted on MRC's website. So um, again, we could not have done this without the collaboration of the mattress industry, not just domestically, but internationally as well. And it's as a result of, of their supports and efforts that um, we are going to see a lot more efforts about sustainability and circularity. Um, scope three, Kyle, Brandon, thank you so much for your help. You guys were just fantastic contractors and uh, appreciate your patience. Um, so I think with that, this one more slide, Kyle, if you could. Thank you. Uh, this is another great infographic that talks about um, the benefits of having statewide EPR programs. Uh, we've, we've demonstrated that. Uh, with MRC's program, there's tremendous benefits that come from recycling steel and foam. Those two commodities in particular drive so much of the savings that we've been able to find. And um, last slide, please. I think this is our closing slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we had a couple of questions that um, I wanted to, to talk about now. And if anybody in the audience has additional, please put those in the Q&A. Um, the first was about um, sustainability and what the mattress industry is doing to put more uh, recycled content back in the mattresses. Uh, one of the reasons why we, we modeled chemical recycling was because right now, almost all of the foam from old mattresses is going into carpet padding. Those markets are limited. Um, consumers are buying less and less carpet every year. And at some point in the future, we are going to have to rely on chemical recycling of the of foam so we can extract the polyols back out of uh, polyurethane foam to then recirculate it back either into new foam or other polyurethane products. Um, that's just a future reality of what we're going to be looking at. And it's already happening in Europe right now, which is very encouraging because we're learning a lot from them. And there was another question um, that we had been asked a number of times as we're developing the LCA and Mike Gallagher, maybe you could take this one. And this was related to um, the scope of the LCA and why did MRC just focus on the point of collection all the way through to recycling? Okay, yeah, thanks Mike. So as a recycling organization, MRC wanted to focus specifically on end of life management for mattresses. It's certainly important to look upstream at mattress manufacturing itself to see what its environmental impacts are. And the way we constructed this study, we can certainly bolt on to those types of studies that are um, uh, going to be conducted in the future. 
It's our understanding though, at, at the time of uh, initiation of this project, that there had not been yet a process to do an LCA um, uh, for the mattress industry, which obviously would be a very, very large undertaking. Um, so I would, I would just say that uh, we constructed this so that it focuses on end of life management. That's a very important component of understanding the life cycle, the entire life cycle of mattresses. And um, we are collaborating with manufacturers and have some actually plans in the future to be involved in an upstream study on manufacturing when the industry takes that on. Thanks, Mike. Um, the next question, Mike Gallagher, I think this is for you as well, because you and I have talked about this before, um, and this is regarding how final consumers uh, looks like could be educated about QR codes uh, to increase awareness of mattress recycling. I'm paraphrasing there, but I think that's where Nassif is headed. Okay, I think um, that's, a, that's an excellent point about knowing what's in a mattress and what we can do with it. So not only for consumers, but for, for recyclers as well. If we can understand the contents of the mattress prior to deconstruction, it can create a whole lot of efficiencies in us managing those products uh, downstream. So there are some efforts uh, to, in Europe that we're seeing a digital passport where there would be a QR code placed on a mattress where we could scan that and there'd be information for recyclers, information for consumers so they can make responsible choices. I think this is something we're very encouraged to see and we're excited because it has just a significant amount of potential for reducing recycling costs as well and for helping us to develop markets for the products that we, we recover. Um, just, just an example is that many times um, uh, their hand uh, inventories are, are uh, uh, developed and understood by hand. There's a lot of manual counting and manual processing, which um, uh, is our current situation today. So these kinds of steps to automate and digitize the entire life cycle of a mattress, I think is a very encouraging development that we're following very, very closely. I don't know if I quite answered the question, but if not, please um, post a follow-up. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, Brandon, I think the next one is for you. Um, why and how did you come up with the percentage of displacement for new material? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, the traditional assumption in, in LCA is that recycling displaces new materials on a one-to-one -one basis, recycle a ton of plastic, you save a ton of plastic. But that's overly optimistic uh, because some recycled materials are used in products that would not otherwise be produced. Uh, some re recycled materials are not up to the, the same grade of performance as virgin materials. Um, and in reality, the credits that we assume for displaced production really only occur if the availability of recycled materials causes primary materials to not be produced. So simply assuming a one-to-one -one uh, relationship may overstate this benefit. But on the other hand, there are a lot of cases where recycled materials clearly do displace primary production. Uh, so the most abundant example is in energy production. If you're putting recycled uh, wood into your, um, you know, to, to burn for energy, then you're not going to need to put other fuels in there to, to burn for energy. Um, and the uh, the carpet pad example is a, is a really good one as well. So it's it's difficult to show uh, or measure the relationship between um, recycled materials becoming available and primary materials not being produced. Um, so we made assumptions based on the types of products that are being produced and what we know about the markets that they're going into. Uh, for fuels and commodities with a high functional equivalence, we assumed a default displacement rate of 90% uh, with a range of 80 to 100%. Um, for market leaders, products for which the mattress drive material is already widely used in the market, uh, we consider those to be less likely to displace new material. And so we assumed a 50% default displacement with a range of 20% 20, 20 to 100%. And for other materials and for products that are reused, uh, we, uh, we just assumed a 75% default uh, with a range of 50 to 100% around that. So we, overall, we just did this in order to um, make sure we weren't overstating 
uh, the benefits, you know, the best practices, uh, best practices require us to pay attention to the uh, big uncertainty in this parameter. It's probably the biggest uncertainty uh, in the study. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, next question was from Suna. Uh, does MRC have initial thoughts on how it might use the LCA results in its program in California, announcement Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Oregon? Um, I'll take my first stab at this in terms of initial thoughts is what we can control. Um, the things that MRC can control um, are related to transportation. We're seeing a pretty significant amount of environmental impacts from that. Anything that we can do to densify mattresses to make our transportation networks more efficient, uh, we are gonna be focused on moving forward. Uh, Mike Gallagher, any other initial thoughts? Yeah, just a couple thoughts. I, I think when we've gone through this exercise in California, there's a lot of data that's transportable, such as the environmental impacts of displacing virgin materials. A lot of these are global markets and the data is pretty well understood. So the displacement benefits are very translatable. Uh, but Mike's right in there are some things that are unique about the system in these other states. They have a different power grid. So the environmental impacts of the electricity that's used will be slightly different. Um, there is also differences in transportation from the number of recycling centers to the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from the collection points to the recycling centers and differences to the distances to end use markets. And these can all be modeled and, and, and we can look at different scenarios. And that's what I think the power of this LCA will be is we can take even a new state like Oregon and start applying some of these assumptions and saying, how many recycling centers do we need? Where should they be? How many collection sites do we need? Where should they be? And I think that's the power of doing an LCA is that we have some data driven type tools now to uh, make those initial assessments and then work from there to approve. I don't know if any, any thoughts from the, the scope three guys on that as well? Pal, I think you're on okay there. You go. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, from my perspective, I, I you know, I think it it can be used to just show the effectiveness of the system as it's currently running. Of course, things can be improved. Okay, things can always be improved, but um I think it's valuable to to quantify these benefits, um, you know, as they are. Yeah. yeah thanks, Kyle. Okay, I had a couple of uh, comments from Nasif. I think I think we answered your question. Ward, you mentioned you have a question on the definition of recycling versus circular versus downcycling, but I don't know what the question is. Um, Send me a note offline. Happy to happy to answer that. He says, "What are they?" Oh, okay. Do you want me to take a stab at that, Mike? I'll give an initial thought, and others can chime in. So, traditionally, the definition of downcycling is basically when you take a recovered material and you use it in a lower value application, you're not recovering the full value of the material. In many cases, an example of this is like grinding materials that are recovered and using them as fillers. Um, there's a, another term called upcycling where we take the material and we somehow use it as a raw material to create a higher value product. And some of these are in our portfolio as well. Uh, for, for all of the materials, um, except for steel, that are recovered from a mattress. And, and some of these where we, we may look, for example, in the rebond market is a good example where we recover the foam and it is then further processed to make a valuable product. Circular economy is, again, that, that and there's an interesting set of, of concepts on what degrees of circularity you can achieve, but the pure circularity, of course, is that you would take the recovered materials and turn them back into a, a manufacturing facilities that would make components for mattresses again. And um, circular has some technical limitations and some regulatory regu uh, limitations for mattresses. In many states, many jurisdictions, 
you actually have some, some laws that prohibit you for hygienic reasons from reusing or uh, uh, mattress materials without you know, announcing them uh, to the consumer that this is a repurposed or reused product. Um, so in, in um, some cases, we have products that can be very circular. Uh, an example of that is steel is extremely circular in that many mattress spring manufacturers do use a high percentage of recycled steel in making new springs. So that's a great example of a circular type arrangement in mattresses. Uh, we'll see if uh, it's early to tell whether or not the chemical recycling to polyols, those pilot facilities in Europe will actually create circularity, um, pure circularity, and what those potential environmental impacts will look like. Uh, but again, that's very early to tell, but it's an interesting development. There's a lot of investment in that area. Hope that I answered that question, uh, or, but if not, yes, send us a, uh, a note and we can perhaps talk about that further. Uh, Ward, you have my contact info. And it looks like uh, Nassif, you're gonna connect with me as well. Um, and with that, unless there's any final questions, we are gonna wrap it up. Wonderful. Um, again, thank you everybody for attending today. We really appreciate your participation and interest uh, in our uh, LCA. Have any additional questions? Feel free to contact us directly. Thank you. Wow. Thanks a lot, everyone.